Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. Today is Wednesday, June 21st, and we are doing today a roundtable on energy. We have some industry leading experts in energy, Doomberg and Dr. Anas Al Haji, and also Ira as well. So, Dr. Al Haji is a world renowned energy markets expert, researcher, author, and a speaker with more than 900 papers, articles, and columns to his credit. He advises governments, companies, financial institutions, investors on various energy markets issues. He focuses on oil and gas market outlook, energy geopolitics, energy security, and the impact of disruptive technologies on the supply and demand of energy. He's managing partner at Energy Outlook Advisors, LLC. Doomberg operates a Substack and subscription newsletter, number one on the finance Substack in the world. Started in May of 2021 to highlight the fundamentals missing from many economic and policy decisions it's quickly grown to be one of the most widely read finance newsletters on Substack. And Ira is independent trader, hedge fund manager, global macro consultant, trading foreign currencies, equities, bonds, and commodities for over 40 years. He was also CME director from 1997 to 2003 and a stint most recently. Welcome everybody. Good morning. Great. Yes, great to be here with, with such a great audience. It's going to be a fantastic discussion. I, I have to ask the ex, existential question. What am I doing here? This is. <laughs> <laughs> I was well, wondering the same thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you are the godfather of this. So we are the show. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh my gosh. okay. I don't know. Wow. All right. I'll try to, I'll try to step it up there. Yeah, we'll, we'll link it all together. Uh, with the uh, financial markets as well in this discussion. Just wondering to begin with um, your outlook on the demand supply situation globally on the energy commodities that you cover in particular. Maybe we can begin with Dr. Al Haji. Uh, thank you. Uh, we published our uh, 2023 oil outlook, oil market outlook in early January. We wrote most of it in December. And uh, we are uh, very pleased with the outlook because uh, the, everything we mentioned in it, especially for the main ideas, already happened. Uh, we predicted that the uh, China opening is not going to lead to massive, to massive increase in oil demand. Uh, we predicted that uh, Russian oil will continue to flow. There will be some decreases throughout the year, uh, but it will continue to uh, flow. Uh, our uh, growth in demand uh, is uh, the lowest among the leading uh, forecasts. Uh, our price uh, was the lowest except for city. I know Doomberg will laugh at this. Um, uh, so the idea was this is for this year, it is the tale of two halves where the first half is different from the second half. So we are looking without a recession uh, we are looking for increase in demand. We are looking for higher prices. However, when we talk about higher prices, we are not talking about uh, significantly higher prices for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that the global economy is still struggling. And the second reason is China will cap prices because China built massive inventories in recent weeks and they are going to use their SPR to prevent prices from going toward the $100. So they will start using their SPR once prices increase by another seven to $8. Uh, and uh, to conclude with this, as you all know, the Saudis are going to start their uh, voluntary cut in July. Uh, and we don't know whether they're going to extend that or not. Uh, but the idea here is very simple, that the Saudis will determine the floor, the Chinese will determine the ceiling, and prices will fluctuate within a limited range. Very 
interesting. And your thoughts, Newberg? Yeah, well, I mean, um, Dr. Anasis, who we turn to for uh, interesting insights into the supply demand scenarios in the oil market. So it's hard for me to add to what Dr. Anas said. I would only say that in addition, um, we found it interesting that the um, mandatory purchases for, uh, sorry, mandatory sales of the U.S. Strategic Petroleum Reserve were wiped out in a, in a bill um, earlier this year. This was brought to our attention by um, our friend Rory Johnson, of, uh, who, who himself writes a great substack on uh, dedicated on the North American oil and gas market. And um, the, the minor sales that we're seeing right now, the releases from the U.S. Strategic Petroleum Reserves are the last of those that we're going to see for a while. And so per Dr. Anas's point, the market probably underappreciates the Chinese pivot towards using its SPR reserves to put a ceiling on prices. And um, it does feel like we're sort of in this 70 to $85 a barrel channel for oil, um, while the other commodities are, are swinging a little bit more wildly, depending on the weather in Europe, i.e. coal and, and natural gas uh, on the regional basis. And so um, I don't think that the world knows the size and extent of the Chinese SBR and their willingness to use it, which I think is a novelty that Dr. Anas has uh, has allowed uh, the rest of the world to, uh, to to understand a little bit better through his writing. Very interesting. And also we have um, Adam Rosenzweig joining here. Uh, welcome, Adam. I'm so sorry, everybody. It, it really um, just a schedule screw up on my end. I can't read a piece of paper, apparently. Oh, no, no worries. So ha happy to have joined us. And just uh... hello, Adam. Hello, hello. I'm so sorry, particularly since we have all of you on. Sorry to waste everyone's time. And a bit of background. Adam's been working focused on the Global Natural Resources Fund, uh, partnered with uh, Mr. Gearing at GNR. Uh, prior to that, Adam worked in the investment banking department at Lehman Brothers. Welcome, long, Adam. Long time ago. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were just um, doing a discussion uh, a roundtable on thoughts of the supply energy situation globally on the energy commodities that you focus on. Um, I know you have a, a bit larger focus than oil and gas, but if you wanted to provide your thoughts, uh, you know, globally with where the demand demand supply situation is. Sure. So I'll, I'll touch briefly on on both of those things. Um, but from a supply perspective, you know, I think we're at a very, very, very dangerous and important inflection point right now. And that's because the shale basins, which heretofore have been an unbelievable source of new supply, um, are, are at risk of depleting. And, you know, to put this in perspective, over the last 15 years, the shale oil side on the liquid side has brought on as much capacity as Saudi Arabia produces. And on the gas side, if you convert it into oil, it's about one and a half times what Saudi Arabia produces in oil equivalency. So you've brought on two and a half Saudi Arabias in 10 years, um, all in the same country. And it's had a huge profound impact on global energy markets that really aren't being appreciated. As I joked with somebody, if you read a history book about Saudi Arabia in the 1950s, I promise you the crude industry features quite prominently in it. But if you read about the 2010s in the United States, to the extent they mention shale at all, they'll say that it was a big value destructor. Um, and most times they probably won't even bring it up. Uh, but it's had a huge profound impact. And so one of the things that that's done is it sort of blinded energy analysts and investors and pundits and policymakers uh, to some of the realities of um, the oil and gas business, notably that fields deplete. And I get why, you know, the oil and gas shales have really felt infinite, particularly back in 2016. We dropped all these rigs. Uh, we took the rig count down 60, 70% and production was still able to grow. Um, shortly thereafter. So it, it was sort of this magical time where it seemed like you didn't need anything in order to just have abundant 2 million barrel a day growth. But as we like to say here, uh, immense is not the same as infinite. And so now you're starting to see gravity take hold a little bit. You're starting to see uh, depletion take hold. And you've seen it in the Eagle Ford and the Bakken, and now you're seeing it in the Permian as well, faster than we would have expected. And that's a really important shift. You know, this is a really, really key change to what's been happening in global oil markets and energy markets for the last 15 years. The idea of cheap, abundant, reliable energies is probably now uh, behind us. And I think that's really profound. 
Interesting. And, and Ira, from a financial markets perspective, what, what are your thoughts? Do you see the similar ranges in oil price, for example, that Dr. Alhaji and Dilberg have mentioned? You know what? I, I loved what uh, Dr. Alhaji talked about. And uh, Dilberg, again, you know, I'm going to ask the existential question, why am I here? But I'm going to try to put some added into it. So, you know, I was kind of surprised about Dr. Alhaji's point, but then I went and looked at my chart of uh, crude oil price in terms of yuan, and it makes perfect sense why they load it up. I, if you would have asked me, where's the price of oil in terms of uh, yuan, I would have said it had to be fairly high because yuan's been weak of late. We, we've gone from 6.75 to about seven, almost 7.2 today, but over of, of a weight over the last two years, we're actually at the very low end of about 516 yuan to a barrel of oil, which I always will look at it in. So it makes perfect sense. So they, they were very, the Chinese are great traders. They're, you know, people compare it to the Japanese. The Japanese were miserable traders in the 70s and 80s. I'm not sure that they're better now, but the Chinese move at the right time. So I think there's, there's a, a lot to that because there will be, as long as they have that strategic petroleum reserve, and we've seen the Chinese do this. They did this last year because during the pandemic, they bought up and make, created huge stockpiles of mm -hmm. oil, copper. And when prices ran up last year, they stepped into the market to protect their uh, producer, their manufacturers of, of other goods with being able to sell them out of the stockpile. So I, I think that's a really important point that we'll need to pay attention to. And in terms of the energy situation in, in Europe, uh, Doombrook, you've covered a lot about that, uh, considerations of what's happening uh, like this past winter and the next coming winter. Uh, any update on that, on your, your current forecast for energy situation in Europe? So one of the things we warned about, um, you know, if we're being totally honest, the Europeans and, and basically the, West, the Western hemisphere in general, um, got lucky because of a relatively warm winter. Um, several sigma deviations from the sort of statistical norms. Uh, winter never really arrived in Europe. And one of the things that we were flagging is that um, it would be a shame if the local politicians confused good luck with sound strategy. And um, and it seems like they have in fact done so, you know, with the closure of the nuclear power plants in Germany and now recently the announcement that the Netherlands is going to um, close the large natural gas fields um, in October, just in time for winter. You know, if we have the reverse, and Lord knows we hope we don't, uh, where we have a multiple sigma deviation to the downside, we could be right back where we started, where, um, you know, the, the Europeans are struggling to keep the lights on just when demand is peaking. And so um, we saw LNG prices picking up a little bit, and, um, and prices for natural gas in the U.S. woke up a little bit uh, in response to that. Uh, but we shall see. I think, again, you know, the winds of Gaia will decide who was quote unquote um, smart and correct uh, in hindsight. Um, but it, it does seem as though locally, um, politicians are taking all of the wrong lessons from a span of good luck. We're publishing a piece tomorrow on, on the really, really dangerous turns that are being taken politically in Europe. Um, we're, we're gonna profile this amazing conference that happened in the European parliament itself called Beyond Growth. You know, the, 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 the whole discourse has this weird Malthusian uh, post-growth future fit European industry about it. And, you know, I'll just close by saying across the uh, two plenaries and eight focus panels and the couple of dozen speakers on stage, there wasn't a single person from industry with any relevant experience um, talking about how Europe should uh, orient itself. It really is amazing. And we tried to listen to it as much as we can, but it's, it's almost insufferable. Um, but the, the whole concept of um, degrowth, um, uh, seizing the means of production, uh, had a very strong communist whiff to it, as we talk about in the piece tomorrow. And so um, we shall see. It doesn't bode well. You, you know, on on the on the demand side of things, I, I think it's so um, fascinating. I think you're you're spot on. You know, everything has this sort of whiff of post growth or degrowth or what have you. And you know, one of the things that <clears throat> I was always shocked by is if you look at the IEA's numbers out to you know under their sustainable development scenario or whatever the different acronyms are, if you look out to 2050, um, it, it suggests that 
per capita energy demand, total primary energy demand per capita declines about 30% between now and then, um, which is ridiculous because, you know, as, as I'm sure everyone on this panel knows, um, we, we, we basically have two types of people in this world. We have a billion people who consume five times the amount of energy per capita than the other 7 billion. And we're bringing as many of them into this group as quickly as we can. And so for everyone, you know, to, to talk about growth and energy demand and things like that, you know, to being flat or down or hold it in check, I mean, it's going to accelerate massively to the upside. In fact, you know, there's a, this is a unique period in time. Uh, the number of the rate in which we're bringing people from that non-OECD world to the OECD world has never been greater in terms of people per, per year. Uh, and, and, and the cohort is, is a fixed number. So if you look in 15 years from now, we're probably going to have worked a lot of that through. But for now, you know, the demand story is going to be unbelievably robust. And, and that has impacts for everything from, from climate policies to um, you know, upstream investment to all these different things that we're doing improperly based on this faulty prediction, many faulty predictions, but one of which is that, you know, demand is going to be, it's the number one question I get. What, what are we going to do with demand weakness? I said, guys, do you understand demand is your friend here for the next little while? And, and like you said, um, you know, you're, you're mixing up a warm winter with, uh, with, with, sound energy policy and things are just going to continue to ratchet into high gear here and so it's, it's quite alarming and the only answer which is horribly malthusian and 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 frankly as far as i'm concerned unacceptable are, are these sort of post-growth we have to do more with less let's just cut gdp and 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 uh our personal um our personal welfare by you know frankly 50 percent is probably what you would need to make the numbers work and and i think that's just terrifying to think of to build on uh, what adam said just uh, let me give you some numbers and i'm talking here only about migration i'm not talking about other countries catching up uh, as you know the u.s brought in a large number of people from afghanistan after the withdrawal from afghanistan and i did the calculation and it turns out that bringing a family to the united states increases its energy demand on the spot by 70 times 70 times just moving them from the united states, from afghanistan to the united states moving ukrainians to europe increases their energy consumption by four times on the spot yeah to give you some more numbers we put a piece on this <coughs> silliness out of ireland about how they're going to um you know, uh, call their cattle in the name of climate change. And we did some back of the envelope, the seven most populous countries in the world, not including the US. So um, you can imagine who they are. Um, if they just increase their energy use by 10%, that would be 32 times the total energy consumption of Ireland. Um, and as we said in the piece, the energy consumption of Ireland is utterly irrelevant. Um, they could, the, the entire citizenry of Ireland, all 5 million of them in change, could reduce their energy demand to zero and the rest of the world would greedily lap up that tiny increment uh, without prices moving even you know, in any perceptible way. Um, the, the scale of it, those seven countries, the seven largest countries not in the G7 represent 3.9 billion people. And those 3.9 billion people use roughly one fifth of the energy of the US on a weighted average basis. Uh, and in, if you actually take out China, uh, it gets much, much worse for the base of that pyramid. And so um, a, a, on a go forward basis, I wholeheartedly support Adam's projection that we've developed in a recent piece, uh, what we jokingly call Doomberg's postulate, which is every molecule of fossil fuels con produced in the world will be consumed by somebody somewhere. Um, and so the only way that we're going to meaningfully impact our, quote, carbon emissions is by restricting production of fossil fuels. But the vast majority of the world where most of the fossil fuels are being produced um, aren't going to listen to European bureaucrats on the matter, and Europe produces almost none of it. Um, and so it, it's, we are going to, the world has decided to walk away from its carbon emission uh, uh, targets. Um, the European and, and uh, US elite have just not internalized the consequences of that yet. Could we be seeing a, a bifurcation in the world between sort of the indebted Western developed world countries uh, maybe following these these carbon emission targets versus the global south world, which appears to be no stoppage in 
globalization and, and usage? And is, is this being reflected in the prices of, of Dubai, uh, Brent, and WTI benchmarks? Do, do you see that? Uh, maybe you start with Dr. Al Haji. Uh, no, for various reasons, but I just want to expand one idea on this one at that. These issues are dynamic, which means that once we go through the process, for example, we have economic crisis in Egypt right now. And if you open the borders, I can assure you more than 1 million guys will go to Europe within a week. So through this dynamic process until we, we have the full effect of it, we are going to see a lot of changes, including massive migration from those countries to the West. Interesting. And your, your thoughts, Dunberg, on that potential bifurcation? Yeah, well, I, I mean, ultimately, um, those people won't be denied, and who are we to try? And so if, if I was looking at it at the high level with the 10-year lens, do I think those 3.9 billion people are going to be using more or less energy 10 years from now? And I think the answer is more. And then on the sort of bifurcation question, actually, I think, um, especially say here in the US, the politics just won't put up with peak growth. Um, look at how Joe Biden panicked heading into the midterm elections and emptied the SBR and tried to keep gasoline prices under $5 a gallon, which on a global scale is relatively cheap. Um, it, the politics of you will do um, less with less is not palatable to the US electorate. And I think um, you know, uh, it, it's only a matter of time before rolling brownouts and energy shortages cause uh, political change. The only question is whether that political change is affected uh, peacefully or not. But uh, uh, the long arc of US history is they're not gonna tolerate presidents who short the, uh, short the country on energy. And so I, I, I do think ultimately there's sort of a, look, energy is life. Uh, all humans everywhere want a higher standard of living. And so that is a fundamental force. Um, the, the beating back the forces of entropy is the human endeavor. And um, politicians who try to you know, um, sing into that wind will get blown over. No, I think Doomberg, I think that's very well said as 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 always. And I think it's it's not just a you know US <clears throat> uh, presidential election issue. You know, globally no one will stand uh, for it. It's never happened. You know, regimes get overthrown and, and people, you know, yearn yearn for growth and they yearn to have have more. Uh, and so I don't I don't think that's gonna change uh in, in any time going forward. And what I think is fascinating, you know, one of the ways we try to think of the world is if you if, if you believe that co2 and climate change you know are, are connected then you basically have two axes one is energy efficiency in which we measure as energy return on investment and the other is carbon intensity so obviously you want high efficiency low carbon wherever possible that's uranium and nuclear you want to stay away from low efficiency high carbon for some reason we tend to like to gravitate towards that as a society that's sort of cutting down old growth forests in the Carolinas and shipping it to Germany. Uh, but for whatever reason, that's called green. And then the others are an interesting debate as to how much efficiency are you willing to give up for less carbon? And and my gut feel there, um, and, and you know, that that's an interesting debate. You know, I think that's a worthy debate to have. My gut feel though, is that that elasticity of, of carbon for efficiency is zero. I think that we're willing to give up zero for less carbon. And in the last 10 years, we've effectively had nearly free energy or certainly very, very cheap, abundant energy. So you haven't really had to make that, that trade off, but just look at what Germany, you know, no one has been more down the green path in Germany. They spent 20 years and trillions of dollars to get, bring themselves to where they are today. And how much hardship did they were they willing to accept before they abandoned it completely and burn more coal than in their history? None. I mean, they didn't even wait for the winter to come. They didn't even wait for the cold winter that everyone was worried about. In retrospect, it's sort of strange that they didn't burn the gas first and then burn the coal after. They burned the coal first and then they never needed to burn the gas in the first place. So, I mean, you just look at the pain threshold that Germany, who's probably, you know, no one is more... Um, religious about climate than Germany, their willingness for pain was zero, 0, 0.0. Uh, and I, I think that should be a lesson, you know, to, to everybody else for, for what their populations can withstand. Adam, um, uh, my expression for Germany is queen of green. <laughs> you know, just to build on what Adam is saying, um, we're, again, we're putting out a piece tomorrow where we quote the UN Secretary General, you know, 
if you think about the history of climate change and, um, and the, the politics around it, it started out as global warming and then it shifted to climate change. Um, and in so doing, we could blame all manner of otherwise normal weather anomalies on, on the pursuit of, of the human endeavor and human flourishing. Uh, I predicted, we predicted this piece and I'll share it with you here that um, we're going to see the same shift away from carbon emissions to quote energy use. And the, the, the Secretary General of the United Nations sort of um, uh, removed the mask on this when he uh, is so violently opposed to the UAE's uh, objective to have COP28 include uh, many sessions around carbon capture and sequestration, which of course, in theory, would allow humanity to unlock the energy of, of our abundance of fossil fuels while minimizing our carbon emissions. And this, of course, is to be as violently opposed as nuclear energy is because the intent is a Malthusian depopulation one. And, um, and so we are going to see a rebranding around carbon emissions causing climate change to human use of energy causing climate change. And uh, you're going to see that propaganda shift uh, ever so subtly uh, over time. It is the, the usage of primary energy by humans that is taxing the Earth's ecosystem. It will no longer be carbon emissions. It will be purely just energy use. And uh, that's coming. And we're putting down the marker wow. in our piece tomorrow. Uh, this is just an addition to what Doomberg says. I think this COP28 in the UAE is going to be different from anyone in the past because they are determined to change the narrative. And that's why we've seen the opposition to Sultan al-Jabir being the head of this because he is a formidable force behind this idea. I think there is cooperation among several countries with China and India and other places where they really want to change the narrative. And uh, I think we are going to see this. They are going to take charge of this. So you are right on the other side, they are going to use the energy, but on the other side, we are going to see a big push uh, against these things. And uh, what people do not realize is that Sultan al-Jabir, who is the head of Cub 28, used to be the head of Mazdar. And Mazdar is one of the largest renewable energy companies uh, in the world. So he came from really from a renewable background before he became the head of ADNOC and a minister and the head of CUP. So he knows all these things uh, inside out, but I am sure that they are going to uh, change the narrative on the other side too. In a sense, uh, regarding your piece tomorrow, you can look at it that yes, the, everyone is going the other side and we are going to see probably more extremes uh, on both sides as a result of those interactions. Oh, sorry, and your thoughts, uh, Ira? Um, well, you also, know, yeah. The, the, the energy perspectives, and of course, we, we keep kind of, and Dr. Uh, Alhaji you know, gets all around it as, as everybody's sitting here. It's the global South divide, which is really, we're walking into this and the Chinese are exploring, it's a bad word. The Chinese are utilizing it to, to, to better their position on a global basis because the cost of doing this on a global basis is enormous. And every time I run through the numbers, and it's especially enormous with rising interest rates to fund a lot of this. So it's a double edge. But you know, I think back to the, and I think about this all the time, the battle in the United States and this concept about reparations. But I would say to the world and Europe, you know, let's go to Dr. Alhaji and uh, Adam. I would say to Europe, you were the progenitors of most of contemporary imperialism that we've seen in the world that has ravaged and raped and plundered so many of the resources that are needed for this. So why shouldn't you be poning up a hell of a lot more money under the name of global reparations? Now the United States, they have to come to terms with their own imperialism on a, um, you know, with, with the Ameri with the Native Americans. And, but for on a global basis, if, if I'm in the global South, I look to you like Lula, you could, you could see Lula's getting his uh, sword sharpened and they're coming after him going, well, you know, it's nice for you to tell us all of this, but when, when you stop using certain types of energy and you drive those prices down, we would be remiss not to utilize maybe more natural gas, maybe more coal. They, 
you know, they've certainly impeded the use of uh, uranium over all these years, but they'll come back to it. And I know that Adam and, and his group have certainly been on top of this, as has Doomberg. So there is a cost to this, and it's a global cost. And who's going to fund it? So you can be busy telling me what I'm supposed to do. And now the United States is trying to get back into the driver's seat with the global South because, again, they have a competitor. You know, the, the, the third world, quote unquote, did fairly well when the, during the Cold War because each side was trying to buy uh, the, res it was trying to buy the support of, of the other side so they could play them off against the middle. When, when, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the world has been a different place, but China is now back in in the United States. And if I'm in the global South, I say, you know what? You've got to deliver more, you've got to prove more because you, know, you bring me to the dance, but if the, if the rising power to your hegemony diminishes, then I'm not, they're no longer a threat. All of a sudden, your aid and comfort to me diminishes dramatically quickly. So China's exploiting that. I, I hate that word. China's utilizing that to try to, to, to further themselves. But, but you know, the, the, if, if we accept, and I, I think we do, that certainly this is a global phenomenon, it's going to be, have to be financed globally. And that's going to be, and tell me how you're going to do it with interest rates rising so dramatically into this world. Let me give you this number on China. Uh, China is the largest spender on renewable energy in the world. So it's number one. Yet, to be carbon neutral, and they, uh, if they maintain their spending the way they are right now, they need at least 211 years. Interesting. And you left everybody speechless in us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess yeah, the, the big question is, is there a transition strategy, if you will, that makes economic sense? And um, not just economic, but, you know, you got to look at uh, notwithstanding a discussion on whether carbon, you know, causes greenhouse gases and all that, but just Put, putting any carbon right as a pollutant from that perspective into the air. Look at, at scope three, right? In, indirect uh, emissions uh, or, or third party emissions of carbon. Like if you look at the whole equation, right? From mining and milling of, of metals necessary to do renewable energy uh, sources and devices. Like, is there a transition path that, that makes sense? Maybe start with Doomberg. Well, as, as we've often said, there is no transition to a carbon, a reduced carbon energy intense grid and um, uh, uh, industrial infrastructure that does not involve a rapid uh, nuclear power renaissance. And, and so um, we can talk about it and we can pretend like it'll happen, but it simply won't because the laws of physics ultimately uh, impede it. Um, the, the opposition to nuclear power, of course, is because precisely because it provides um, low carbon abundant energy to the masses. And this is the great nightmare um, uh, of the, of the um, elite among us, because you know, that this means that the resource drain on all the other commodities that the world needs to produce in order to maintain these lifestyles in their mind is, um, is impossible. In our view, that is a, a, deeply sh a deeply short position on human ingenuity. And um, you know, the limits to growth was published 51 years ago, if you can imagine. And uh, no book has ever been proven more incorrect uh, uh, than that one. And yet still, as we outline in the piece tomorrow, the co-president of the Club for Rome was sharing a stage with the president of the European Commission uh, at this Beyond Growth Conference. I mean, uh, old habits die hard, as we like to say. Um, as recently as 2016, the, the Club for Rome was advocating for a one-child policy in the developed world, if you can believe it, uh, given the demographic challenges that we are facing. Um, and so, I mean, we have long argued that the equation to be optimized is the total amount of standard of living divided by our carbon emissions. And you can't just focus on the denominator without pondering the consequences of the numerator, both politically and practically. And um, 
And of course, our, your standard of living is nothing more than a proxy for the total amount of energy you get to waste beating back the forces of entropy. And every human everywhere wants a higher standard of living for themselves and their family. And that is um, unethical for us to assume otherwise or to impose upon the billions of people uh, trying to climb up the economic ladder that they just shall not um, so that we can maintain our privileged position at the top. Um, and so a far better bet ethically, economically, uh, uh, and morally to try to invent the technologies, to develop the technologies, to deploy the technologies, frankly, that already exist, um, i.e. nuclear power, uh, you know, um, pro proliferating the use of natural gas over coal, et cetera, um, strict, much, much stricter uh, pollution enforcement, which is just as terrible for the environment as um, any imagined consequences of climate change. Um, there's so many low hanging fruits in this regard that we could collectively decide are a priority, um, but we seem to be myopically focused on on carbon emissions for now, and, and as we predict ultimately on energy use uh, here in the near term. Great perspective. And your thoughts, Dr. Al Haji, on the transition? Um, I, uh, years ago, I uh, created measures for energy security, and I developed something called the Energy Security Star. The Energy Security Star has six sides, and uh, the implication of it the political and economic implications of it. That was developed during the Bush, George Bush years, and it was kind of trying to, an advice to the Bush administration, but it did not work out because they did not understand what I was talking about. The best climate change conference, basically, is to go and give every representative of every country their own energy security star. It will have kind of a myopic change, I'm kind of like shape, a very strange shape, because it has six dimensions and each dimension is different from the others, et cetera, based on their numbers. And if you can imagine this as like six dimensional shape with different sizes, and every country has different shape and different sizes to, to each dimension, and you tell them, look, I want you to come back next year, but I want the area of that shape that I give you to be larger. I don't care how much, just make sure it is larger. And the idea here is very simple. Those dimensions compete with each other and they complement each other at the same time, which means that if you try to enlarge one dimension, the others might collapse. And sometimes you might enlarge one dimension and the others will grow with it too. So from to, to balance this energy security with environmental security with the other dimensions that economic, social, technology, et cetera, et cetera, the, the six dimensions, all you get to do is play the game where that area is going to be larger. And once it gets larger for any country, it benefits the whole world. So the idea here is, yes, is there a doable approach? Yes. Do we need experts for that? Yes. But as Dunberg basically mentioned, that they are focusing only on one dimension, and that makes the other dimensions collapse. And when they collapse, everyone starts screaming. And that's what the, my fear that the extremism on both sides is going to increase. And that's bad for everyone. Interesting. And your thoughts, Adam, for the transition? Well, <clears throat> you know, we, we've written extensively on our views uh, of the importance of nuclear power. And again, it gets back to this idea of <clears throat> energy return on investment. And, and if you go back through human history, you know, there was really kind of two major, major seismic shifts in, in, in human history. And the first was when <clears throat> societies went from being hunter gatherers to domesticating uh, both seeds and then animals. And of course, that meant that your the societal return on energy invested became much more because you could now, uh, for every unit of energy you put into the system, you could get more out. You could also transfer some of that energy into the future by storing grains from one year into the next. And so that all happened right around the time that, you know, the first early recorded writings took place, that that was really sort of the the dawn of modern society as we know it. The next, of course, was when we lived in that same level uh, of of agrarian, you know, subsistence lifestyles, using biomass as our main source of energy for, <clears throat> we say two thousand years because that's where our data goes back, but really thirty thousand years, mm -hmm. and and then all of a sudden, um, 
you know, and for every unit of energy you put into that system, you got five units of usable energy out the other side. And that was enough to basically allow the human population to grow one time in, in nature, but then sustain effectively no growth. Real GDP grew by 0.01% per year for 2000 years. Population doubled from AD zero to 1650. So I mean, these are really shocking, the low numbers. And it's because you put one unit of energy and you get five units out, one goes back to reinvest into more energy, three go to <clears throat> your house and your subsistence living, and, and, and one goes to your animals uh, to keep them alive. And so what you end up with basically when it's all said and done is no surplus energy, no surplus capital to be able to grow. And as Junberg said, to be able to beat back the forces of entropy. And that was in place until Britain basically cut down their last tree and they moved from wood at that point to to coal. <clears throat> and all of a sudden they started to realize that they could liberate more energy per unit of energy being invested in. So now you had surplus, you had growth, and it was off to the races and everything changed. And so here we are with sort of the next question of where do we go from here and the history of human ingenuity and the history of societal beating back of the forces of entropy um, have always been one of greater and greater and greater efficiencies. And so to think that we'll go from oil and gas, which is about 30 to one EROI today, <clears throat> back to wind and solar, which is low as 10, uh, is nonsense. And, and anything needs to go up and to the right. It needs to be more efficient than what it's replacing. Money and costs are a funny proxy. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. They can be distorted by subsidies, but the true underlying physics of it really never deviate. And, and we've never seen a widespread adoption of a source of energy that's with far inferior EROI. And the irony, of course, like, like Doomberg said, is that we have it all sitting in front of us. This is 50, 60 year old technology. However, we haven't really needed to rely on it so badly uh, as of yet. And so we've allowed ourselves to worry about these sort of boogeymen of uh, safety issues uh, to stop us from the wholesale uh, embracing of nuclear power, but we don't have that luxury anymore. You know, now we, we sort of have this really difficult fork in the road where a we're running out of supply of a lot of traditional hydrocarbons at least in the short and medium term until we can recapitalize that industry and second we have this sort of existential sort of damocles hanging over us in the form of carbon change or climate change and so now maybe my hope and we can sort of you know end my 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 little speech here on a very positive note, because a lot of this is extremely pessimistic and seems very, very dire and Malthusian and um, conspiratorial almost at times. But on a positive note, perhaps what we're going through now will be a catalyst to force people uh, to understand some of the realities here. And if we can embrace nuclear power, uh, with an EROI of between 100 to 1 and 180 to 1, that would be as significant an event as moving from hunting gathering to, uh, to domesticated crops and moving from biofuels to coal. Each of those were, were seismic step changes in, in human advancement. And so I'm, I'm actually quite optimistic that our uh, best days lie ahead because I am a big believer in human ingenuity. We have the technologies here in front of us. And if we can just basically get our head out of our ass and begin to embrace some of these things, we have the potential for something that is as important and as positive as what we've seen um, in, uh, in in the past. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm wildly, wildly optimistic. Right now, the only people standing in the way are the policymakers. But again, to, to bet on the policymakers over over progress is to bet against human ingenuity. And I'm not willing to do that. Mm -hmm. Great points. And I guess, Ira, from an investment perspective, like what makes sense uh, given all these trends, geopolitical risks, uh, and even resource nationalism risks that we really haven't gotten into the potential for that? Uh, where do you see the investment opportunities? Is it in energy efficiency companies or types of economical uh, energy uh, that makes sense, you know, using ag waste for, for hydrogen or something or nuclear um, or, or in the actual commodities. Where, where do you see that, uh, Ira? Well, you know, it's been a tough investment world for that. And, and, you know, and I'm really anti-ESG, not only because I've sat on a corporate board and I know how this works and it's 
and it's a nice branding for consultancies to push forward. But I think it leads to a lot of uh, mal investments because people are doing things not for the best economic outcomes, but for what you know appears to be the best. Um, so you know, I've been in I've been in and out of uh, hydrogen following uh, what's his name who. Uh, was out of Michigan back in the late 1990s, uh, energy conversion, uh, I forget what his, what, his, what his name was, who got bought out. And I've, I've been involved in Ballard Power thinking that hydrogen was gonna provide some alternative. I've loved nuclear over the time. Um, and I always think that, uh, you know, you, th you do throw some money, meaning the private sector and with the government. You know, I'm, listen, we, we, we got a lot out of NASA spending out of the space program in the 50s and 60s that generated a whole lot more uh, innovation. Uh, and I think that's when government works really well, when they see some things and, and step back and let, and, and monitor it for fraud and other things. But, you know, there's, there's enough going on. I know in, in um, Adam's last piece, they talk about in the copper mining. So it's a company that I know pretty well that they write about, Jetty. And in fact, I uh, um, actually invested in it through a, a third party. So things like that that, that are changing and are, they're good changes and they're going on. And you know, Adam could probably talk a little bit to that. So I still like the mining companies because you know, I'm like a four-year-old, I like to get dirty. Uh, and uh, I, I respect people who put their hands in the ground. Doomberg had me laughing because he's talking about the limits to growth. Well. I still have my dog-eared copy from 1972. Okay. And I remember walking into a class in 1974. It was a throwaway class for me, economic geography. The first day of the class, it was a, I hate to use this, but I, I it was a very redneck rural base. I was at the University of Illinois. So he was in, in a rural based professor. And the first thing he says, this is 1974. September of night, there is no energy crisis. It's a crisis of price. Now I've devoured the limits of growth where it really comes out in my, that's how much I, I, I absorb that because I came from a socialist background and all of a sudden I had to sit up in my seat and go, what do you mean? Of course there's an energy crisis. And he said, no, the Rocky Mountains are full of shale oil. If, if the oil price of oil goes high enough, you'll see oil pour out. It changed my whole perspective. I had to sit up and go, I don't know much about anything. Yeah, that's what I said to myself, walking out of class. I was, it was a class I needed to graduate. I was at the end of my undergraduate. So it's all quite funny, but I'm still looking at mining company and ad companies, because we're gonna eat. And as, and as Adam talks about, and Doomberg talks about, you know, all these people, and I talked to friends of mine, kids, and they would say, oh, you gotta eat organic. You gotta go to Whole Foods. I go, the world's not gonna be fed organically, no matter what you think. And if you believe that, then you sit here and decide what three and a half billion people, and I know Doomberg talks about that all the time, are not gonna make it. Cause you're not gonna make it. So yeah, it's not perfect, but hell the people who are actually out there doing it. And that's why I say, I love the mining companies and I, and I have four kids and I, I pushed all of them to be mining engineers of some sort, because I, I said, if I could redo it, that's what I would do. I would, I would be with Dr. Uh, I'd be down in Oklahoma. It, there's no question about it, because I always loved it, but I yeah. kind of shied away from it, more important than ever, and doing it right. So like when Adam talks about Jetty, I, I mean, the people I'm with, they're invested in it for that reason. It's an advancement, because you're going to need copper. Copper is the... Uh, right now is the, is the metal that will also, it's as much as nuclear energy, it's gonna transition us through this period of time. So if you can do it better, and I think that's the history of mankind. Yeah, we lay waste to a lot of things, just like they talk about with cutting down trees and the last tree, we find ways to do it better. And then, oh, we can even do it better than that. So. Oh, cool, great points. And your thoughts, Stoomberg, on the investment implications? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> sorry, the, the investment implications are obviously, you know, short term and difficult to model and, and so on. And I leave it to others who are in this sort of investing world, like Adam and his team, uh, 
to pontificate there, but I would say, as I'm listening to this conversation, you know, there is this metric that I'm trying to build in my head about total um, energy consumption per GDP produced, and then the cost of that, the value of that energy, and then the sort of cyclical nature of that um, is something that I've been trying to figure out in my head and maybe write about someday. And so that's certainly on our radar. But if I just look sort of globally, you know, um, energy arbitrage is a great way to play the markets, right? And so if you have um, artificially cheap natural gas in the US and manufacturers who are back integrated to it, who can price their products on a global basis, then they're going to be just fine. And if you have mandated um, battery uh, proliferation across the transportation sector and a shortage of, of new mines being permitted, then you probably want to be um, putting your hand out the window and grabbing some of that cash as well. Um, when we look at the investment landscape um, in the energy sector, we sort of we see uh, three ways to play it. There's just undoubtedly a fire hose of cash coming from the investment, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act and the, the co-investment that comes with it. And so you could proactively decide to invest in what we call promotes, where um, growth in the renewable space is being artificially rewarded uh, in excess in the markets in the same way that artificial intelligence is being rewarded today and um, ESG was being rewarded, you know, say in the past. Uh, a second way to play those is the shovels to gold miners analogy, where you find a high barrier pinch point, a provider of some unique adhesive in the wind turbine sector, or pick your favorite uh, enabling technology in solar or in batteries. And you recognize that that company and that investment is um, is sort of sitting on a uh, on the Titanic and you want to get off before um, the iceberg is, is, is in front of you. And then the third is to invest in contras, which is the sort of classic value investor play where you know in the long run this has to self-correct and uh, you just have to be have access to very patient capital uh, in order to be able to wait that trade out. And that, that's the way we look at the market and then sort of any particulars that come along the way, we try to model through that lens. Great. And your thoughts, Dr. Alhaji, on the investment implications? Uh, generally speaking, I'm, I'm just going to elaborate more on what has been said. As long as there are government subsidies or tax breaks or any preferential treatment, uh, people can make money out of the government policy on the renewable side, on the green policies uh, side. They can capitalize on it in terms of reputation or other things, et cetera. Uh, still, in my view, and I think uh, all of us here uh, agree on this point, that uh, oil and gas is going to be in the medium and long term is going to be probably the best investment because of the failure of some of the green policies and natural gas in particular is going to be the fuel by default. However, we are having a serious problem now, and I don't know whether I'm coining this term or not. Probably it, it does exist. Uh, and we're all familiar with the term uh, racial profiling. And now we are experiencing climate change profiling. Seriously. What, what if you look at it in terms of conferences, meetings, uh, doing consulting for the government, etc., when they check the background of the person, if they classify them as unfit for climate change, they literally cancel them. So you'll be invited to a conference, you are registered there, you are already there, your name is appearing there, and wow. then you get an email say, sorry, canceled. Wow. Uh, so this this climate change uh, uh, profiling basically is becoming a serious problem. And what the implication of that is, if people are not going to hear the other side, then this investment that we are talking about probably will be screwed because the true experts are not there at the table. And what uh, uh, Doomberg was saying earlier about the head of the UN and what he was talking about, as we know, in the previous COP, in COP26 in Glasgow, they did not allow the oil companies to, to, to be part of it. So if those who produce most of the carbon in the world are not at the table, then no, no one is going to listen to them. So the investment is going to be screwed no matter what. And the last point, which is a very scary point, imagine a country like the UAE or Saudi Arabia or Kuwait where you have a new generation that is completely brainwashed and they are anti-oil and therefore by uh, default, they are anti the future of their, of their country. And uh, I met one of the, the, the CEO of one of the largest uh, companies in the Gulf, who is from Saudi Arabia. And he told me he's having serious problems with his 14 year old daughter who is born in Saudi Arabia, educated in Saudi Arabia, but she hates him 
because he is destroying the planet. So we, we, we have serious problems on the ground that's just going to screw that investment no matter what. Yeah, those are interesting points. And uh, finally, your thoughts, Adam, given your uh, focus on the Global National Resources Fund, how does the investment implications shape that investment philosophy and approach? Well, it's, it's really interesting. You know, we are value investors and we're contrarian investors. And so we've had um, to deal with some of the questions that Doomberg brought up before. And, and if I can put words in his beak, um, okay. what, what, yeah. what it really comes down to is, is the idea of if you don't think something works fundamentally, but you're pretty sure it's going to work as a stock, do you want to own it? And, and I think that is the fine line that separates an investor from a speculator where the speculator, you know, it's traditionally said relies on somebody else to buy it away from them in order to make their money versus an investor would be happy to own it in perpetuity. And so we, we try to stay true to that. And, and so that leaves us sort of out of the market with, of certain things on the wind and solar yeah. side, but I'm fully cognizant, you know, just looking at the economic incentives put in place by the inflation reduction act, which are astounding. And I'm sure in this group and, you know, for the people uh, around us, uh, maybe we understand, but, but I have to admit, even I was surprised when I really dug into the amount of subsidies and the extent to which the subsidies reached the, renewable energy industry, it's, it's dramatic. And, and so a lot of the stuff's going to work. So what do we do? Um, what we have chosen to do is we choose to stay on the side of fundamental investing and just deal with the pain uh, that sometimes comes from that. And, and you know, I like to hope that a lot of that pain is behind us now. I think 2020 was probably the parabolic blow off bottom. However, you never know. Uh, and certainly now, I mean, I think I think that resource investors have gotten a little bit soft. Everyone's complaining now. You know, things are off like twenty percent in the last uh, in the last twelve months, and the whole you know market in the last eighteen months is, we're still leading. So the pain isn't so bad. It, natural gas has been the particularly challenging place to be. So we try to be fundamentally driven. We try to stay contrarian, and when we see the bizarre, irrational behavior around us, we try to take advantage. It's easier said than done. But I agree that if you're a trader, uh, if you're probably a little bit more you know, financially entrepreneurial, you, you probably could find ways to take advantage of, of this malinvestment that's being directed into different parts of the renewable energy areas. But for us, if it doesn't work, then we don't want to do it. You probably could make a lot of money starting your own renewable company frankly. I'd probably prefer to do that than to buy something with the vagaries of a multiple attached to it. You probably could just spin up your own and, and um, you know, make good money just just collecting rent from the government. Well, uh, Adam, we've often daydreamed internally as a joke about the startup that we could create given our experience in the VC space and the, the spin that we could provide given our knowledge of the sector and what people want to hear. And um, that, again, um, is really just putting your money behind what you know in advance to be a greater fool's trade, which is yep. very, very difficult to do for value-oriented fundamental investors. And, and I would augment my answer and, and yours um, reminding me to do so with the following, which is, in fact, we do believe that in particular in the contra plays, you know, the things that have to work in the long run, um, it's almost always best to do that privately if you can get access to the deal flow and, and you're an accredited investor because management is not distracted by the need to pretend like they care about ESG and uh, and in reality, they remunerate shareholders via dividends and and recapitalizations and um, and it's if it's easier to operate in a highly regulated um, political market like the energy space uh, in the private domain, then they will press that advantage. And and in our experience, we do most of our investing in the private sector. Um, you you can have direct impact on management team. You can see the outcomes um, more clearly. That doesn't help people who have a mandate to only public uh, publicly invest, but um, there are huge opportunities to capture these arbitrages in the private sector. If I may add, I'm picking up where Adam, on the natural gas, because natural gas has been a difficult, difficult speculative trade and longer trade. But, you know, I look at it in perspective, and it's the opposite of what 2005, 2006, when Amaranth was trying to squeeze the natural gas futures market and paid with the, with the company. But the, the natural gas stocks, the equities were moving down while Amaranth was squeezing the price. And I kept watching, I go, something is wrong here. Something is wrong. 
and the, and the forward price for natural gas was had a ridiculous carry to it. The contango was unbelievable, and then of course it all collapsed. This time is almost the inversion because the natural gas stocks, and I'm looking at LNG. You know, I'm looking at uh, Southwest Energy, uh, uh, Range Resources. They've all held up phenomenally well in the face of collapsing natural gas prices. So it has my radar. Up. I'm not really moving yet, but this is, I'm all, you know, I learned back in 2005 to trust natural gas stocks, I think more than I trust the, uh, and I'm a futures trader. So more than to, uh, to, to, so it's going on here in the inverse and it really has my attention. I mean, we haven't seen the price move yet, but natural gas did suffer from the, uh, I won't say suffer, benefited from uh, the warm winter, the warm uh, winter, especially. But we're in the middle of a hot summer, so I'm watching this closely. And you're starting to see the grain prices already react to the low carryovers. And uh, so, and we have a lot of things going on here. But natural gas is very interesting. I agree that but natural that, gas is our is our is our um, highest conviction investment idea at this point. Uh, just a comment to, to explain uh, uh, what uh, Ira said about the uh, the opposite of the past. I think one of the reasons why, because major oil producers in shale plays have become the major gas producers. Oh, uh, so yeah, there, there's somebody with a great expertise to, uh, yeah. to. Uh... Well, great. Yeah, it's been a great points and perspective by all. Uh, if we can do a quick round on how, how can our listeners and viewers learn more about your work? Like, is there a Substack or, or a website link, uh, Doomberg? Yeah, of course, doomberg.substack.com is where we publish six to eight times per month on energy finance and the economy at large. We are 100% subscriber supported. We almost never um, have investment positions in the things we write about. And when we do, we disclose it. And so, um, and the thing that makes us unique is we come from industry, of course, and we are liberated to speak uh, the truth from the industry perspective in ways that uh, people who are currently participating on the industrial side can't. And so a uh, great pleasure, uh, an honor to share the stage with uh, Dr. Anas and Adam, and I uh, really appreciate it, guys. We always have a great conversation, and I enjoyed the group setting. Great. And Dr. Al-Haji? You're on uh, mute. Yeah. Um, uh, it is really a pleasure to uh, share this stage with uh, Doomberg and Adam and with you guys, with Ira. Uh, so thank you very much for giving me this honor. Um, I am very active on uh, Twitter. We do have two newsletters. One of them is the Daily Energy Report, and the other one is what we call the Weekly Energy uh, uh, Newsletter. Uh, both of them are subs subscriptions. But uh, most of the money we make is out of the speaking engagements, not from the substacks. Uh, the uh, other uh, one basically is the website, nslhaji.com. Great. And Adam? Well, we also have a newsletter. We don't have a sub stack, but I'm thinking maybe we should. Uh, everything that we do is free uh, and we are investment managers. So we have positions in pretty much everything that we write about. We have no cost for our newsletter, uh, but we are, you know. Okay as as uh, invested in, in all of the things. So we are not a dispassionate third party. We are actually uh, investment fund managers first and foremost. And you can uh, find our writing on our website, gorozen, G-O-R-O-Z-E-N.com, where um, I write along with my partner, Lee Gehring, um, who's might here in the background doing another podcast as we speak. So we're, we're quite active and um, would encourage anyone to come. Uh, and I really enjoyed this conversation uh, with all of you uh, as well. So it's nice to meet you all. Adam, uh, the Substack only for the poor guys. <laughs> That's not <Yeah>. true. <laughs> okay. And uh, Ira, finally for... Uh, your link, your, your uh, link. Yeah. Well, well, my initial question still stands. What am I doing here? This was a great, a great group to, to sit with. I mean, it's it's a true existential question. I I devour everything that everybody here writes. I read. So it's the main say It's a fourteen hour a day endeavor to do this business. Uh, and I, I mean, I have 
the latest from <laughs> so I know and I go through that and it's all annotated and Doomberg I read whatever he publishes and we talk about and Dr. Not, I follow him wherever he goes. Uh, so I click on and wherever he speaks and it's available. So I very appreciate it. And, you know, I, to, in my world, I try to bring it all together. So when people talk about this, when they put that, you know, and now Dr. Alhaji's view on the ceiling and floor with the Chinese and the, and the Saudis, very important. And I will be very attuned to that. Because I like when ceilings and floors give way. That tells me a greater story. Because I think the story, I think his analysis is dead right on target. And when I run currency relationships to the price of oil, I know it's dead on target. Because you know it surprises me that oil you know went that low over the last two years. So it makes sense for the Chinese to stockpile. There's nobody's fool in the way that they operate. Um, so. I'm just still still around, kicking around. I still do uh, what I've always done. I write the blog, although not as much as I used to. And I look forward to doing these because it gives me an opportunity to sit truly with some of the best uh, thinkers that there are. Awesome. It's been Thank a great perspective by all. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk.